Hey, good morning, Calvary, and happy Valentine's Day. We're so glad you can join us today. It has been a cold week, and we hope that today's service warms your heart in a great way. Uh, we're going to take a break today from our Habakkuk series, and I want you to find a little book in your Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. It's right after Psalms and Proverbs, and we're going to take a walk through Ecclesiastes today. So open up your Bible to that book. Uh, we're going to do a Zoom foyer today at 1030. I'd love to see you jump in. Go to our website, find the online service tab, and you will find a link there to get an invite. It's just a chance to check in and say hello at 1030. And then next Sunday, uh, we're going to wrap up our complaint department series. And I want to have a chance to hear back from you what you've gotten out of Habakkuk, what questions it's raised, how you find it applying to your life. So we're going to do that live for those here in the building at 1030 next Sunday. And there'll also be a Zoom link to do it online at 6 p.m. next Sunday night. So if you'd like to just have a little chance to visit and talk about what we found in Habakkuk, I hope you'll take that opportunity to do it. Well, <clears throat> today's series is uh, inspired after probably about 25 years of reading Ecclesiastes, probably once a year. And it's also inspired by my wife, who had the wisdom and foresight to buy us a board game for Christmas. In fact, she went ahead and bought these for several of our family members. It's a tabletop foosball, and it's a kick of fun. <clears throat> now, what do you use this for? Well, after supper, uh, best three out of five uh, decides who does the dishes. And uh, you have probably been uh, maybe home a lot. Uh, maybe your family work environment has been more stressful than most years. Maybe you haven't seen a lot of family and friends and done a lot of activities. And so today I want to bring us back to Ecclesiastes for what I think is a very important message today. Can you enjoy your God-given life right where you're at today in the midst of all life's troubles? Uh, so our title is, How Can You Be Mostly Happily Married? And I say mostly happy because when you took your wedding vows, it was for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. And all of us who are married get a combination of all those factors. And over my years of helping couples uh, get ready for marriage and watching hundreds of couples walk out their marriage, seeing some bloom and unfold like flowers and others unravel like tissue in the wind. I've got one really important tip for you today that I think is uh, super important. So you might want to write this down. If you want to be mostly happily married, it helps to be happy when you show up. Yeah, genius, I know. But this is true not just for marriage. This is true for all of life. If you want to be mostly happily married or single, it helps to be happy when you show up. If you want to be mostly happy when you're raising little kids or teenagers or empty nester, it helps to be happy when you show up. If you want to be mostly happy in the day-to-day -day grind of your work life or in what comes after your career is ended, it helps to be happy when you show up. So I'm going to preach a little different today because we're going to basically bounce through the entire book of Ecclesiastes, not taking it all in, but hitting some key highlights that uh, frame this question of can you enjoy your God-given life? So um, keep that Bible open because we're going to be turning pages today. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1 is where we're going to start out. We're just going to read three verses. If you got it open, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. It says, these are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? We're going to pause and take a break right there. Let's pray, and then we're going to come back to this word of God. Uh, Father in heaven, today... Um, we thank you for the gift of love, for the gift of family, uh, both in marriage, our siblings, our parents, our kids, our grandkids, aunts and uncles. Lord, you have knit humanity together in a way that we need each other. 
and we have the opportunity to bless and love and encourage each other through all the ups and downs, the highs and lows, all the twists and turns of life. And Lord, this year has had a lot of twists and turns. And Lord, some of us going through this winter, uh, it's been a tough one for many people. So Lord God, I pray that today as we come to your word, your Holy Spirit will take it and use it and apply it to our lives so that we can hear from you what your will is for our lives as we face life's challenges. Lord, we want to do it in your power, in your strength, in a way that brings glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, if you're new to Ecclesiastes, these words, meaningless, meaningless, everything's meaningless, is the backdrop to the whole book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a book that faces the frustrations, disappointments, futilities of ordinary life. Life can be unfair. Life can advertise things that are going to satisfy you and bring you peace and contentment, and it doesn't work out that way. <coughs> Time will wipe away our accomplishments, and get this, in the end, death catches all of us. So how's this for a happy Valentine's message? I know, it seems a little bleak. The word in Hebrew for meaningless here, or your translation might say vanity, is smoke or vapor. So it's like the author is saying, this is a little bit what life is like. You try and grab hold of it. You try and catch it and it slips through your fingers. It's there. It's gone too quickly. <laughs> All of us going through life will face those frustrations and disappointments. Uh, all of us will come to these milestones in life where we look back and we say, how did it go by so quickly? That's the backdrop of this book. Now, there's another important phrase here you need to catch. Verse 3, what do people get for all their hard work under the sun? That's an important line that comes back again and again and again in Ecclesiastes. There are going to be times if you read through Ecclesiastes where you're scratching your head perplexed because you're going to be saying, well, what about eternal life? Well, what about heaven? Well, what about being with God forever? That is a true and genuine and rich New Testament hope, but that's not primarily Ecclesiastes' concern. The concern here is life down here in the mud and blood and sweat and tears and frustrations of daily life. What does it mean to live with wisdom, to live in a way that honors God, in a way that makes the most of your life down here now with all life's problems and frustrations? <coughs> so, don't miss Ecclesiastes' message because um, he is really looking at what does it mean to live in wisdom in the problems of this life that we're in the middle of. <coughs> so the Bible has three wisdom books. You're going to need them all at some point. Proverbs is how to make life work, how to manage life wisely. Job is a book of wisdom dealing with the problem of unjust suffering and how do you have an enduring faith. Well, Ecclesiastes looks how to get the most out of life, how to please God in the midst of the troubles that we all face. So we're going to jump to the back of the book, turn all the way back to chapter 12, the last couple verses, because Ecclesiastes saves the punchline, the finale for the very end, when it captures the essence of what it means to live in biblical wisdom. So look at chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, he says, that's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God, obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. In the Bible, the fear of the Lord is not a bad thing. It's not a being terrorized of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is a reverence for God that recognizes He's in charge of everything. He's given us everything. And our responsibility is by faith to learn to trust and obey Him. The fear of the wisdom is to turn away from evil and to learn to love the things that God loves and to do life God's way. In the words of the prophet Micah, it's to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. So in this world, if we look for everything to be fair and everything to be just and everything to be the way it's supposed to be, we will be consistently disappointed. 
But there will be a day in the presence of God when all that is good is rewarded and all that is corrupt and wrong is dealt with. Now, here's a key issue. What we think about obeying God and doing God's will as our duty, as our responsibility, that's going to reveal what we believe about God. Is he a good God whose ways are good, who wants to lead us in a direction of blessing in a life that is uh, one that God can smile at and that we can enjoy even with life's problems? Or is it drudgery? Is God just out to make people miserable? Or is it more like Jesus when he says, come to me, you who are tired and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you trust that God's directions for your life are ultimately for your good and your benefit? That's what's uh, the big question here. So we're going to back up again, go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Because I want you to see in Ecclesiastes what God's will for your life is. There is a theme that runs um, almost like a drumbeat. You never get very far in Ecclesiastes before you run into this theme that keeps coming back time and time and time again. And when the Bible repeats something, it's important to pay attention to that because, um, you know, when they wrote the Bible, they didn't have yellow highlighters. They didn't have bold font. <coughs> but biblical writers often use repetition to drive home the main point. And this is what I would call is the counsel of Ecclesiastes for living in an often frustrating world. Look at chapter 2, verse 22. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 22. He writes, uh, So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. And even at night, their minds cannot rest. It's all meaningless. Now, many of you have experienced that firsthand. That is not an uncommon human experience. But look at what he says here. So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in work. And then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from Him? God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to those who please Him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please Him. This is too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. So, Understand that what the teacher is saying here is that the good things in life are gifts from God, which God would be pleased for us to enjoy. This is not a deep dive into materialistic consumption. The whole lead up to this counsel is the futility of a life that's dedicated only to uh, possessions or accomplishments or success or fame. If we just live for this world, we end up empty. But when we see that the good things in this life are gifts from a good God, God does want them to then enjoy them. And these are the things of ordinary life, your food and drink. Do you take time to enjoy it? Do you have time to taste the food that God has given you? Do you have time to have some sense of satisfaction in the work, whether it be your career or whether it be the ordinary things of taking care of a home and chores and doing the dishes? Is there some satisfaction in the assignments that God has given you? And it's not only tangible goods, but it's the intangible. For it is God who gives the soul wisdom and knowledge and joy. So if you want to be mostly happily married or single, mostly happily employed or retired, are you able to enjoy what God has given you today? Now, flip a page over. We're going to go to chapter 3, verse 12, because this is going to come back again. Chapter 3, verse 12. <clears throat> now, the lead up to this is the extremities of life. Uh, there is birth and there is death. There is planting and there is harvest. There is peace and there is war. There is um, uh, silence and speaking. All these uh, extreme elements of life. And God uses these things to stir in us a longing to know him. He said eternity in our hearts. We long for eternity. And yet when we look at the world, we're often confused 
by what God is doing and where is God's plan in all this? We often don't understand. But look at what he says in verse 12. So I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor for these are gifts from God. So here again, this isn't just for lifestyles of the rich and famous. This is for ordinary people in their ordinary life. Can you see that the food on your table, that the work in your office or in your shop is God's gift to you and God would be pleased for you to be able to be grateful and to enjoy them and to uh, savor the life that God has given you. Uh, drop down a few verses to verse 22. Now the lead up to verse 22 is the certainty of death. In Ecclesiastes, that's another theme that we never get very far away from. Death is a certainty for all. But look at what he says in verse 22, same chapter. Chapter 2, verse 22. So I saw there is nothing better for people than to be happy in their work. That's why we're here. No one will bring us back from death to enjoy life after we die. Now that last line takes us back because we're like, well, what about Christ and the hope of the resurrection and eternal life? That's all true. But in the story of uh, the Bible unfolding over centuries, that comes later. Right here in Ecclesiastes, his view is under the sun. This world, how do I live with God and for God in a God-honoring way now. And it is to recognize that my life's work is a gift from God. So can I enjoy it? So I'll tell you a little snapshot here, a personal one. Last Monday we had staff meeting. It was about 25 below zero. Sunday was the same temperature, so Sunday turnout had been extremely light. It just was one of those days when you hope the car starts and nothing breaks down. Uh, standing outside can be painful if you're out there too long. And yet in our staff meeting here, with all of life's challenges, and we have plenty, there was a lightness. Uh, there was a sharing, uh, what's going on in your life and family. There was some room for laughter and for some humor and for some prayer and for sharing our concerns with each other. Uh, that day, or a couple days later, our custodian, Tony, he pulled a little office prank on me. He left something in my office that made me jump and made me laugh. And Tony brings that kind of enjoyment to his work here every day. And the question is for you and I, can we do the same? If you want to be mostly happy on the job, it helps to be happy when you show up. If you want to be mostly happy as you're raising those kids and paying the bills and dealing with all the things you got to deal with in life, it helps enormously if you're able to pause and see the good things in life that God has given you. The Hebrew word enjoy here, that's really what it means. Enjoy is to see the good. And folks, when we get immersed in the problems of life and the troubles of this world, we can lose sight of the good. We can get to a place in our hearts where all we see is trouble and confusion and turmoil. And Ecclesiastes is saying all those problems are real. The injustices of life, the unfairness of life, the uncertainty of life, that's all true. But it is also true that God's will for you would be to see the good in your ordinary daily life, your family, your work, your meals, the things that God has provided for you. Flip over to chapter 5, verse 16. We're going to come at it again. Chapter 5, verse 16. <clears throat> um, the lead up to this is corruption in government, the futility of living for money, and the unpredictability of life. So look what chapter 5, verse 16 says. He says, this too is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, angry. Folks, does any of that sound familiar to you? Have you seen that? I bet you have. Have you felt it? Probably but look at what he says. Even so, I noticed one thing at least. 
That is good. It's good for people to eat and drink and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them and to accept their lot in life. Don't miss that. To accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. <clears throat> uh, Tuck Geving uh, lived in Walker his whole life, a uh, member of this church for most of his life. Uh, always used to sit in the back row. Uh, got a lot of memories of Tuck. My last memory of Tuck in person was visiting him at the nursing home. And his uh, age and health had gotten to the point where he had to, to be in, a, in an assisted living center. And I remember Karen and I going in to visit him, and I think it was last winter, and uh, Tuck had this big smile. And when I asked him, how are the staff? Oh, the staff are good. Tuck, how's the food? Oh, the food's real good. And we sat down at this table. This was before COVID, and he's introducing us to the other people who he's living with there. Now, many of us would look at that and say, oh, man, being in a, a care facility, that would be the worst thing that would happen. I'm telling you, Tuck had the ability to enjoy what God had put around him that day. And that makes all the difference. Whether you're in a care facility, whether you're isolated at home, or whether you're putting in long days at work every day, this is key. Can you enjoy your God-given life? <coughs> uh, look at uh, chapter 8, verse 15. We're going to be here again. Chapter 8, verse 15. The lead up to this verse is the unfairness of life. <coughs> or verse 14. Uh, this is not all that is meaningless in our world. In this life, good people are often treated as though they're wicked. And wicked people are often treated as though they're good. This is meaningless. This is like smoke. So I recommend having fun. Because there is nothing better for people in this world than to eat and drink and enjoy life. That they, we, they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. Again, the viewpoint is living with God in the world that you're in the middle of right now. Are you able to enjoy it? Are you able to enjoy the things that God has already given you? I was talking to a guy recently whose company is going through a merger. And you know, when they go through a merger, people are going to lose jobs. And they put these really nice, fancy corporate words on downsizing. Like, you know, we're going to um, we're, we're going to boost uh, productivity and, and it's going to be great. And everybody knows in the back of their heads, not everybody's going to have a job when this is done. And he said the office politics had gotten kind of stabby in the back. I mean, look out because there were just people who you wouldn't expect to do and respond the way they did. And he said this, you know, I hope I'm able to keep my job because I enjoy 75% of it. And in this life, if you've got a job that you can enjoy 75% of, you're doing really good. So my question is that for you, are you able to thrive and appreciate and enjoy and be grateful for a 75% okay job? Can you enjoy the food uh, the home, the clothing that God has already given you? Or is there a constant fretting and a, a frustration over what you don't have or what you didn't get or what you didn't accomplish? Or is there ability to relax and be thankful today for what God's put right on your table right now? Drop down to chapter 9, verse 7. Chapter 9, verse 7. <coughs> the lead up to this is the certainty of death. Are we serious yet? I mean, I hope you're having a great Valentine's because I know we're dealing with some tough stuff here. But I want you to see what he says in chapter 9, verse 7. This is the sixth time he says it. So go ahead. Eat your food with joy. Drink your wine with a happy heart. For God approves of this. Wear fine clothes. Put on a splash of cologne. Live happily with the woman you love 
through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun, the wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. Folks, that's why I say that if you want to be mostly happily married, it helps a lot to be mostly happy when you show up. Because if I come home to my wife frustrated about everything, angry at work, upset with the neighbors, disappointed in the kids, why didn't mom and dad do this? Why don't my siblings do that? Why don't my friends call? Upset with the church, upset with the government, upset with the weather, upset. Friends, how in the world can I enjoy my wife if I show up in a constant state of fretting and frustration and disappointment and disillusion? Yes, life is hard and no, the world is not fair. And yet God's will for our lives would be to by faith and trust in him to be grateful, to be joyful in the good things that he has given us. And that includes the family that we have, whether you're married or not. This is as true for the widowed as for the married. This is true for the one who's raising the little kids or working through the homework years or uh, sending kids off to college and work or maybe an empty nester. Oh, why don't they call? Hey, it helps to be mostly happy in all of your relationships if you're mostly happy in a joy that comes from the Lord, in, in seeking to walk in a fullness of the Holy Spirit with gratitude for what God has already given you. Let me ask you a question. Can you write down a list today of 10 family members that you're thankful for? Can you write down a list of 10 uh, co-workers or neighbors or old friends who you haven't seen in a long time that you're thankful for? Can you write down a list looking back over these recent weeks and months of some times that were moments of joy and gratitude and living life in spite of all of its difficulties? Folks, this is a, an attitude of the heart that we cultivate over a lifetime. And I don't want you to miss it, and I don't want to miss it either. <clears throat> Joy is serious business. And joy comes from the Lord. And joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And joy, if you want to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to others, joy is contagious, attractive, winsome. And folks, when we cultivate a life of enjoying what God has given us, then we have something to give away to the world to share with our family, something that ultimately pleases God and changes us. So, like many of you, it's been a different year for me in terms of just the amount of time with family, vastly limited. I'm thinking about my dad today. Uh, my dad uh, still enjoys going out to check the cattle every day. My dad still enjoys being out in the pickup truck or the tractor. Life has changed medically, absolutely, but he finds joy in the assignments that God has put in front of him. And in every meal, uh, my dad, almost without exception, is grateful for every meal he partakes, whether it's going out to eat or a big Sunday dinner or whether it's simply lunch of leftovers. A practice of gratitude, of being thankful for what you got. I'm thinking of my mom today, my mom who always understood the value of a good book to unwind when life is challenging or uh, sitting down at the piano and making music that's uplifting to the spirit or a board game with family and friends, cards, um, uh, skip bow and other games that we've played over the years. Folks, these are the things where we find joy in an ordinary life. So don't miss it. So I read about Frank and Gail. Uh, the first date, first time they met, <clears throat> Her response to Frank was, look at the hick with no tie. I bet I get stuck with him. And she did. And he was so broke, he didn't have money for burgers. But they talked. Decided to call each other the next day. A few days later, Gail took Frank to the farm to meet her folks. And her mom's response was, I hope you're not planning on marrying my daughter because you'll marry her over my dead body. Well, Gail says, 
a week later they got married and mom didn't die. Now Frank was so broke, he was gonna borrow $40 from his dad for the honeymoon and in his enthusiasm, he forgot to get the money. So they drove to the lake and they got a $20 bill for honeymoon. They get a motel for $3 a night and they live three days on 75 cent burger baskets and they looked at the water. Now, I've done a lot of premarital counseling and watched a lot of couples. Do I recommend anybody get married in a week when they're broke? Probably not. But I tell you what, Frank and Gail must have figured out how to enjoy their God-given life because it lasted 57 years. It helps if you can enjoy a 75 cent burger basket and be happy when you show up. I'm thinking about a couple I read about today in the Pioneer Press, uh, Merlin and Elaine Adder of Maplewood giving out some marriage advice. They said, don't stay mad too long, hold hands and yes, kiss. And it doesn't hurt to throw in some polka music and waltzes. How long have Merlin and Elaine been married? 75 years. Let me ask you, when's the last time you danced with your wife? Do you hold her hand every day? Do you smile at each other? Do you find a time to have some fun and enjoy your God-given life right where you're at? Folks, <clears throat> it's been a long winter. It's been a cold week. It's been a tough year for a lot of people. And we are all longing for the return of that thing we call normal. And who knows when it'll get here. But I do know this. <clears throat> Don't waste your days. Don't let the week sleep, slip by without enjoying what God has given you in the here and now. Because wisdom is to live in the fear of the Lord and obey Him and to do your duty. And from the sounds of what I hear in Ecclesiastes, it sounds like it would very much please our maker if we would enjoy the gifts that he's already put in our hands. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit in us, we would learn to live this out. In our marriage for those who are married, married in our work for those who are employed, in whatever stage of life we may be, Father, would you guide us in how to wake up to the day knowing that you love us and you have blessed us in many ways and we can bring a smile and we can bring a full heart, not because all the world's problems are solved, but because you are a good God and you have given us many good gifts to give us a full heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a closing song and then a benediction. Thanks for staying with us today.